All right. So let's start with hematology review. So first of all, let's talk about elements of the blood, okay? Elements inside the blood. What do we have? So as you can see, this is the blood vessel, okay? Inside the blood vessel, what do we have? We have mainly, we have plasma, right? As you can see, this yellow liquid, plasma. Inside the plasma, what do we have? We have RBCs, we have WBCs, we have platelets. Those are the three main elements, RBC, platelets, and WBC. In this picture, we have WBCs. How many different types of WBC? Five different types. We have monocytes, lymphocytes, eosinophil, basophil, and neutrophils. So what is the difference between these WBCs? As you can see, monocytes and lymphocytes, right? It does not have any granules on top of this. So those are agranulocytes. Eosinophil, basophil, and neutrophil. Those have granules on top of this. So that's why it's called granulocytes, okay? No granules, which is agranulocytes. Granules, that is granulocytes. Now let's review the CBC because in primary care, number one lab that we are reviewing, that's going to be CBC and also CMP as well. That has kidney function, liver function, and all this. But here we are discussing hematology, so we're going to talk about CBC. Okay. So far, you know, you knew about WBC and RBC and hemoglobin and hematocrit, all this platelets, right? Now, what do we have to learn extra? MCV. MCH, RDW, lymphocytes, monocytes, neutrophils, all of these. What does that mean? That's what we need to know, okay? So WBC, when we look at, when we review CBC, what do we look? Number one thing, hemoglobin. Number two, WBC, then RBC, then hematocrit and MCV and all this, okay? Number one thing is WBC, RBC, hemoglobin, and platelet. Those are the main component, right? If we see that person's hemoglobin is low, then we look at something else. Then we look at their hemo hematocrit. When somebody's hemoglobin is low, automatically their hematocrit is going to be low, okay? Then we look at their WBC. WBC can be low or it can be high. RBC. It can be low or it can be high. Similarly, you know, MCV and MCH as well, it can be low or high. Platelet, it can be low or it can be high. Neutrophils, neutrophils, when somebody has bacterial infection going on, it can be high. So those are the things we look, okay? We need to figure it out when we look at CBC, okay? If they have low hemoglobin, we need to figure it out, like which type of anemia we are looking at or we are worried about, okay? Now, let's talk about in detail. How does this CBC look like, okay? And in detail, what does it mean? So let's talk about WBC first. WBC, that is white blood cells, okay? So there are five different WBCs. We have neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophil, and basophil. What is the job of WBC? WBC fights infection. So basically, when somebody has bacterial infection going on, it's going to be up. When somebody has leukemia going on, going on you know, WBC, it's going to be elevated. Now let's talk about RBC. Those are red blood cells. How does this RBC help? RBC carry oxygen throughout the body. When somebody has low level of RBC, what can happen? Low oxygen, right? Low oxygen level. That's why level of RBC is very important. When somebody has low level of RBC, how does it occur? Maybe they have anemia of chronic disease. They have low level of RBC. 
Maybe they are bleeding, low level of RBC. Malnutrition, not eating properly. If they have kidney disease, that is anemia of chronic disease. So in those conditions, RBC, which can be down. Then we talk about hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, what is hemoglobin? In one RBC, okay, RBC, those are discord-shaped RBC, right? In one RBC, they have four different sites where hemoglobin binds, okay? So one RBC has four hemoglobin molecules. What does hemoglobin do? Hemoglobin is a protein that carries oxygen. In which condition they can have low hemoglobin? If they are bleeding, okay, low hemoglobin. Anemia of chronic disease, low hemoglobin. In certain condition, their hemoglobin goes up as well. Which condition their hemoglobin goes up? COPD patient, person who is taking supplemental testosterone, their hemoglobin goes up as well. Dehydration, hemoglobin goes up. Polycythemia. What is polycythemia? Too many RBCs. That is polycythemia. Level of RBC is higher. Okay, that's called polycythemia. In that case, hemoglobin automatically gonna be high. Now, hematocrit. So, most of the time, hemoglobin and hematocrit goes together. Okay, if hemoglobin is down, Hematocrit is going to be down as well. If hemoglobin up, hematocrit is up as well. Then we have MCV. This is very important. What is MCV? Mean corpuscle volume. So MCV, it's going to tell you the size, size of RBC. It can be big, it can be small, it can be normal. So if it's normal, we don't worry about anything if it's normal. But if it's low or, or if it's like smaller size, okay, MCV, numbers are low. That means size is small. That means either person has iron deficiency anemia or thalassemia, two different things. If it's higher, the RBC size, if it's big, what does that mean? Megaloblastic anemia which is B12 deficiency or folate deficiency anemia. So depending on the size of the RBC, we can decide like which anemia is going on, okay? We can suspect if it's, if it's smaller size, that means iron deficiency or thalassemia. If it's bigger size, that means it's B12 or folate deficiency anemia. Then we have MCH. Okay, MCH and MCHC, that is concentration, okay? So MCH, we're gonna talk about MCH. Mean corpuscle hemoglobin, what does that mean? MCH means color, color of the RBC. It can be lighter, it can be darker, or it can be normal, okay? That is MCH. Then we have RDW. What is RDW? W means width width of the RBC. For example, okay, you are looking at the Petri dish, okay, Petri dish. And in that dish, one RBC is smaller, the other RBC is bigger, the other RBC is normal, you know, multiple different sizes, okay? So when one RBC is smaller and the other one is bigger, the width is going to be different, okay? So RDW, that is the red cell distribution width. Depending on what type of anemia going on, if they have iron deficiency anemia, this RDW goes up, okay, thalassemia. Most of the time for thalassemia, the RDW is normal. Then we have platelets. Platelets are sticky cells that help to form the blood clot, okay? It sticks together. When somebody is bleeding, what stops bleeding? All those 
platelets, they come together, they aggregate, okay? And it stops bleeding by making a blood clot. So those are the different component in the CBC. Now let's talk about different types of anemia. So when we see that person has low hemoglobin and low hematocrit, okay? Their RBC that is lower as well. The next step we look that is MCV. MCV is gonna tell you the size of RBC. If they have normal size RBC, but if they have hemoglobin and hematocrit that is low, what does that mean? RBC size is fine, but something else going on. Either that kidney is not producing enough EPO, EPO, right? So kidney produces that hormone, okay? And that hormone encourages bone marrow to produce more RBC, right? So if kidney is not working properly, then they can have normal RBCs, but low hemoglobin and low hematocrit. If they have G6PD deficiency, they can have normal size RBC, but low hemoglobin, low hematocrit. So those are the common condition where they have normal MCV. The size of the RBC is perfectly normal. Then in some condition, their RBC size is smaller and they have anemia. Their hemoglobin is down, their hematocrit is down, and their RBC size is smaller as well. Which conditions are those? Iron deficiency anemia, thalassemia, two major conditions. Either it can be iron deficiency or thalassemia. Then we have RBC size that is big, bigger and hemoglobin is low and hematocrit is low. So what does that mean? If their RBC size is big, either they have megaloblastic anemia, which is B12 deficiency, or folate deficiency anemia. Now let's talk about iron deficiency anemia. So what is going on here? Iron deficiency anemia. There are multiple different causes to have low iron. Okay, maybe this person is bleeding. They are having GI bleed. Maybe they are having menorrhagia. Maybe they have IBS. Maybe they have peptic ulcer disease. Maybe they have colon cancer, GI malignancy. Maybe this person is pregnant. Multiple different cause to have iron deficiency anemia. Maybe somebody is not eating properly poor dietary intake. Maybe somebody has parasitic infection or celiac disease. So those are the condition where person would have low iron and they will, they will have iron deficiency anemia. So how would we identify like what is going on with the patient? So number one complaint they're gonna have is they feel shortness of breath they would feel fatigued, they would be weak, irritable. Fatigue, weakness, and shortness of breath, and paler looking skin, those are the four main findings when person has iron deficiency anemia. Paler looking skin, or their nail beds, okay? They have shortness of breath, they feel fatigued, they feel weak. Those are the main signs and symptoms. They have exercise intolerance because of the shortness of breath. They also have glossitis, red beefy tongue. Glossitis means red beefy tongue. They also have this, is, it's called craving for vague stuff. Those are not considered food, okay? They are chewing on ice chips sometimes. That is called pica or pica. Sometimes they have this spoon-shaped nails that, that is called colinachia. Colinachia, which is spoon-shaped nails, as you can see in this picture. So those are the main findings when somebody has iron deficiency anemia. 
So how do you diagnose this patient? Yes, you know, first of all, you obtain their history, then you um, ask them about their sign and symptoms. Then you want to order labs. So what do you order? First of all, you know, you are looking at the CBC, their hemoglobin is down, their hematocrit is down, their MCV, which is the size of the RBC is down. That's going to tell you that person probably have thalassemia or iron deficiency anemia. So do you chase after ruling out thalassemia or are you going to chase after ruling out first iron deficiency anemia? First of all, it's going to be iron deficiency anemia. So for iron deficiency anemia, what are the extra labs that you're going to order? You already have hemoglobin, hematocrit, RBC, size of the RBC, everything. So what do you need? You need, it's called iron studies. When you order iron studies, what's gonna have in that iron studies? You will have serum iron. You're gonna have ferritine. What is ferritine? Ferritine level, that is the storage of the iron storage okay so you want to know what is their actual serum iron is and what is the storage in the background that is ferritin in the iron studies you also gonna have TIBC TIBC is total iron binding capacity when somebody who has low iron or iron poor body what can have they're going to have iron binding capacity that goes up. So TIBC, it's going to be up. And RDW, it's obviously going to be up because of the width of the RBC, because RBC, it's going to be smaller. Couple of RBC, it's going to be normal size. Couple of them, it's going to be smaller size. So that's why RDW goes up. So when you order iron studies, their serum iron level is going to be down. Their ferritin level, that is the storage of iron, it's going to be down as well. And RDW, the width of the RBC, it's going to be elevated. And total iron binding capacity, it's going to be elevated as well. So I'm going to give you this example here. If somebody is poor, they don't have any money, okay? If they don't have any money, do you think they're gonna have bank balance? No. So their bank balance is gonna be down as well. No money, that means serum iron, it's gonna be down. Bank balance, which is ferritin, it's gonna be down as well. And money accepting capacity, it's gonna go up because they don't have any money, right? So here, TIBC, total iron binding capacity it's gonna go up. This is the easy way to understand this. So when somebody has this iron deficiency anemia, what do you do? You treat underlying problems, like figure it out, like why do they have iron deficiency anemia? Are they having bleeding from somewhere? Do they have some kind of infection going on? What is going on in the background? You treat underlying problems, you get rid of the problems, and then you treat, you give them medicine, okay? So which medicine you're going to give them? Ferrous sulfate. Ferrous sulfate, 325 milligram, three times a day. So here's the thing. You're going to fill out their bank as well, which is ferritin level. Storage. Because their tank is empty, right? So you're going to have to fill out that tank as well. So how long does it take? Ferritin, it's going to tell you six month storage of the iron. When tank is empty, we have to fill out the tank for rest of the six months. So ferrous sulfate, 325 milligram, three times a day for six months. Also, we're going to give them or advise person to intake iron rich food. Then we have thalassemia. 
for thalassemia, this is genetic disorder, okay? There are two main types, thalassemia minor and major. If they have minor thalassemia, they're not gonna have any symptom, no sign and symptom. But if they have major thalassemia, they're gonna have sign and symptoms. Where they have spleen is enlarged, their liver is enlarged, they're gonna have jaundice looking skin, abdominal swelling, stuff like that. So what is the problem with this disease, thalassemia? As you can see in this picture, RBCs, one side is normal and the other side is malformed RBC. The shape of the RBC is totally different. This shape is not like round and dish square shape of RBC. This is totally different shape of RBC. That's where the problem is with thalassemia. They don't have like, you know, um, hemoglobin molecule is low and nothing like that. This shape of the RBC also has like four different sites of hemoglobin that they attach to, okay? So only thing is change here is shape of the RBC, that's it. And that's why when this shape is changed, those RBC does not last long for like 120 days because normal shaped RBC, they last long for like 120 days. This different shape of RBC doesn't last long for full day. Maybe they last long for like 50 to 60 days and that's about it. So how would you diagnose this patient? Mainly when you are reviewing their CBC, okay? They are not telling you that, yeah, I have thalassemia. They don't even know it, okay? So how would you diagnose patient? You are reviewing their CBC. You are looking at their hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, you notice that this is a little bit down. Hematocrit is down. Then what do you look at? MCV. Size of RBC. Size of RBC, MCV is low. Then you think about, well, is it going to be iron deficiency or thalassemia? So in that case, you're going to order iron studies. If somebody has thalassemia, their iron studies, it's going to be completely normal. The ferritin level is going to be normal. Serum iron is going to be normal. Total iron bending capacity is going to be normal. RDW is going to be normal. Everything's normal. Then you will think about, oh, this is not iron deficiency anemia. Then it's probably thalassemia. So to confirm the diagnosis, what do you do? Now you are worried about thalassemia. So what do you do? So the gold standard to rule out thalassemia, that is hemoglobin electroparesis. So the really good question is, why would you order hemoglobin electroparesis? Yes, it's because it's a gold standard. Yes, I understand. But why would you order this? What information you're going to get when you order this? It's going to tell you the shape of the RBC. And clearly, it's going to be positive, okay? Because RBC shaped is totally different here. So that's why for thalassemia, gold standard is hemoglobin electroparesis. There is another condition where you're going to order same testing, hemoglobin electroparesis. Which condition is this? In that condition, the RBC shape is totally different. Sickle cell anemia. They have sickle shaped RBC. Whichever condition, you want to know the shape of the RBC, right? You're going to order hemoglobin electroparesis. That is gold standard. So what do you do for thalassemia patients? If it's minor, they're not going to have any major sign and symptoms, you know, so you leave them alone. If they don't have any sign and symptoms, not to worry. If they have sign and symptoms and if they have major thalassemia, that person will undergo for blood transfusion, 
more often if they have severe to moderate condition. Then we have sickle cell anemia. So for sickle cell, as you can see, this is normal RBC. And on the other side, we have sickle shaped RBC. And that's why those RBC, you know, doesn't last long for like 120 days. Those RBC last long for maybe like 17 to 20 days. It's their lifespan, only 20 days, not even 120 days. Those are sickle-shaped RBC. This is autosomal recessive disorder. This patient, when they have those different shaped RBC, they are high risk for sickle cell crisis. High risk for sickle cell crisis. If they go anywhere where they're gonna have low oxygen level, higher altitude, okay, if they go higher in the sky, they're gonna have low oxygen level. And that is the time they're gonna have more sickling episode, very fast. The total RBC inside the body, okay, to bring the more oxygen, it's gonna constantly gonna break apart and it's gonna go towards the spleen. When RBC is breaking out, where does it go? End product, where does it go? It goes all towards the spleen, okay? It's gonna go towards the spleen. So what can happen from the bone? What does bone do at that time? It's gonna try to produce more and more and more RBC. Doesn't matter if they're gonna have it more or stored more or nothing. You know, it's just gonna keep producing. So when it just automatically produces RBC, what type of RBC is gonna come out from the bone marrow? Immature RBC. Immature RBC, okay? And that's why when somebody has sickle cell anemia and they are going through sickle cell crisis, okay when they are admitted in the hospital what do we order to check their disease progression is it is it getting better is it getting worse what do we order reticulocyte count okay reticulocyte count so what does this reticulocyte count it's gonna tell you what type of information it's gonna give so reticular side count, it's gonna tell you how much RBC bone marrow is producing. Those are immature RBCs. It's gonna tell you the demand inside the body. If person is getting better, reticular side count, it's gonna calm down. But if person is still under this severe crisis, bone marrow it continues to produce those immature RBC. And during that time, reticulocyte count, it's gonna be elevated constantly. So that's the purpose behind ordering reticulocyte count. When somebody is going through sickle cell crisis, what kind of signs and symptoms they're gonna have? Severe abdominal pain because RBC is producing and it's gonna break apart, it's gonna go towards the spleen area. And that's why they have belly pain. When somebody's going through crisis, they're gonna have severe joint pain. They're gonna have weakness. They're gonna have fever. They're gonna have priapism. What is priapism? Priapism means they have this, erection, okay, that is longer than four hours. Prolonged and painful erection that lasts long for more than four hours and there is medical emergency. So those are the signs and symptoms. When somebody has sickle cell crisis going on, they have mainly their fever and joint pain. They also are undergoing through dehydration. So what do we do? Hydration is number one treatment for sickle cell crisis, hydration. 
for sickle cell. What is the screening test? Screening test is sickle dex. And gold standard is whichever test is gonna check the shape of the RBC, that is hemoglobin electroporesis. When somebody has sickle cell anemia, which doctor do they go to? We refer them to hematologist. When we talk about like which type of vaccine those patient gets, are there any restriction for those patients to get any vaccines? No, this patient are high risk for infection. So they are susceptible to infection, right? So they're gonna get all kind of vaccine that the normal person would get who does not have sickle cell disease. Sickle cell person would get each and every vaccine that person without disease would get. Then we have anemia of chronic disease. Anemia of chronic disease means they have low hemoglobin and low hematocrit and their RBC is down as well. All the other labs are good. So why do they have low hemoglobin and low hematocrit? Why? Are they bleeding? Not actively, not right now, but they probably oozing blood sometimes or once in a while. And that's their norm because of the disease. So that's called anemia of chronic disease. They have this chronic disease, okay? For example, chronic kidney disease. Kidney is producing erythropoietin, okay, erythropoietin. And when somebody has kidney disease, it doesn't produce that. So that hormone is, is no longer there, right? So it's not gonna encourage bone marrow to produce more RBC and all this. So encouraging factor is not there. That's why they have chronically low hemoglobin because of the chronic disease. If they have some kind of malignancy, they're gonna have low hemoglobin. Inflammatory bowel disease, they're gonna have low hemoglobin as well. Thyroid disease collagen vascular disease, those are the patients can have anemia of chronic disease. Their RBC is low, their hemoglobin is low, their hematocrit is low. So what do we do? Time to time, we give them iron therapy, IV iron infusion, maybe 15 days or once, once a month, okay? Also, when somebody has kidney disease, okay, and they are on dialysis. So after the dialysis, they get injection to increase their RBC production from the bone marrow, okay? So that injection after the dialysis, they get if they have anemia of chronic disease. That's called erythropoiesis stimulating agent. Plus, in some cases, they get iron therapy as well. Then we have aplastic anemia. <clears throat> so what is aplastic anemia? Aplastic anemia. This is bone marrow issue. This is pathological condition, which body does not produce enough RBC. Aplastic anemia. Basically, it doesn't produce any of those cells. WBC, it's going to be low. RBC, it's going to be low. Platelet, it's going to be low. Everything's going to be low. That is aplastic anemia. Destruction of the stem cells inside bone marrow. Multiple different conditions that patient has gone through. And that's why they have this destruction of the stem cells. Either they underwent for you know, chemotherapy. And because of that, they had aplastic anemia. Either they underwent for radiation. 
either they had some kind of viral infection, okay? All those conditions make the person have aplastic anemia. So how do we diagnose patient? How do we know that this is aplastic anemia? Sometimes patients have this, without any reason, they feel fatigued, they feel tired, they feel weak. They have this easy bruising going on. They get multiple different infections, okay? When we order CBC, that CBC, it shows that the RBC is low, their hemoglobin is low, WBC is low, platelet is low. When all those four components in the blood that is low, that means something is going on with their bone marrow. Low RBC, low WBC, low hemoglobin, low platelet. What does that call? That's called pancytopenia. Main, main component, those are low. So that's called pancytopenia. How do we diagnose patient? Like how do we, how do we check patient that they have aplastic anemia? In the labs, if they have everything low, that means pancytopenia. When we see this pancytopenia, what is the next step we do? What is the other blood test we order? Other blood test, it's called peripheral blood smear. Peripheral blood smear. In that smear, it's going to tell us shape of the RBC. All this. Pancytopenia. So in peripheral blood smear, it's going to tell us the reason for the pancytopenia. Okay. It's going to tell us all those differential diagnoses as well. And gold standard, if we worry about, you know, something is going on with the bone marrow, right? So what do we do? Blood test, it's going to tell us which direction we need to go, okay? So gold standard for aplastic anemia, that is bone marrow biopsy. Bone marrow biopsy is going to tell us, is that person's bone marrow is working properly or not, okay? So gold standard for aplastic anemia, that is, bone marrow biopsy. And what do we do at the end? We refer patient to hematologist. Then we have B12 deficiency anemia. So which one is the first thing? It's going to tell us that, yes, we need to check patient for B12 deficiency anemia. When we review CBC, which component in that CBC is going to tell us? that this patient probably has B12 deficiency. Size of the RBC. If size is big, that means either it's B12 deficiency or folate deficiency anemia. Causes of vitamin B12 deficiency. Either it can be pernicious anemia or it can be malabsorption. So what type of sign and symptoms patient presents with? Mainly when they have B12 deficiency, they're going to have numbness and tingling in their hands and feet. Okay, their hands and feet is just like sometimes they have this numbness and tingling. They also have glossitis, red beefy tongue. They also have abnormal Romberg test. They have difficulty walking. All this. Main sign and symptoms for B12 deficiency anemia. That is numbness and tingling in their hands and feet, okay? So when somebody has B12 deficiency, they present with all those sign and symptoms. What test do you order? You order B12 level. When somebody has B12 deficiency, their B12 level goes down, okay? What is the diagnostic test? homeocysteine level. Homeocysteine level, it's going to be down. 
that is B12 deficiency. So when somebody has B12 deficiency, what do we do? First of all, you know, number one cause for B12 deficiency that is pernicious anemia. So if we wanna rule that out, we can. If we wanna find out like, okay, I'm just thinking maybe, you know, in this patient, pernicious anemia has caused B12. So let me just order antiparietal cell antibody test to check and see if it's positive, that means patient has pernicious anemia. And that's why patient has B12 deficiency. You can do that as well. But your treatment plan is not gonna change if you do this or not to do this. You know, your treatment plan is gonna stay same. But if you are curious, you can order this antiparietal cell antibody test. Otherwise, you let it go because choice of treatment is same. Either they have B12 or pernicious anemia, same choice of treatment. Choice of treatment is injections, B12 injections. They have to take every week initially, every week for one month. And then they take it for like once a month. But here's the thing with B12. Once they have this B12 diagnosis, like they have this B12 deficiency anemia, they have to take those injections forever in their life. Initially every week for one month and then they take it once a month for life. That is 1000 MCG weekly initially. Then we have folic acid deficiency anemia. Folic acid deficiency. Mainly what is happening here? Inadequate dietary intake of folic acid can cause person to have anemia. So what kind of sign and symptoms do they have? They also have weakness. They also have feeling fatigue. They have glossitis. Glossitis, that means red beefy tongue. Malabsorption. Malabsorption, if they have problem with absorption, then they can have folic acid deficiency anemia. But sign and symptoms, they feel fatigue, weak glossitis. Those are the main sign and symptoms. Person who is seriously high risk for folic acid deficiency, that is alcoholic patient. They can have folic acid deficiency, they can have thiamine deficiency, all this. So how do you know that they have folic acid deficiency anemia? First of all, you are looking at their CBC. That's the number one thing. Their hemoglobin is down, their hematocrit is down, their MCV, size of RBC. Size of RBC, it's bigger. Then you probably think like, well, it's gonna be either B12 or folic acid deficiency. So what do you order? You can order B12 level and you can order folate level. If they have B12 deficiency, B12, it's gonna be down. If they have folic acid deficiency, their folate level is going to be down. And that's it. Easy diagnosis for this one. What do we tell patient? We encourage patient to eat folate-rich food, such as avocado, Brussels sprouts, green leafy vegetables, asparagus, broccoli, papaya, bell peppers, beet, cauliflower. Those are the food, those are rich in folic acid. First of all, we have to figure it out like why this person has folic acid deficiency anemia. Find out the cause. Advise patient to eat folate rich food and then give them supplement as well. Folic acid tablet. One to five milligram daily. That's the choice of treatment.
Now, let's talk about WBC. So, so far we talked about, you know, hemoglobin and all this, RBC and hemoglobin. Now, we're going to talk about WBC. So, like I said before, WBC, you know, we have granulocytes and we have a granulocytes. Granulocytes, as you can see in this picture, neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. Those has, you know, small, small granules on top of that. That's why. And then we have monocytes and lymphocytes. No granules. Those are a granulocytes. Under monocytes, we have microphages and dendritic cells. And under lymphocytes, we have B lymphocytes, C lymphocytes, and natural killer cells. Those are not in this picture. But under lymphocytes, we have B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells. When we talk about Hodgkin's lymphoma, okay, we will talk about those B cells. Those are type of WBC. When somebody has cancer, and there is specifically Hodgkin's lymphoma, that's what we will talk about. Those are B cells cancer, okay? And non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, that, that's going to be natural killer cell, that is NK cell, that is part of the lymphocytes. Now, let's talk about neutropenia. What is neutropenia? Neutropenia means low level of WBC. Low level of WBC. Decreased production. It can be inherited stem cell disorder. What causes this neutropenia? Cancer. If they have some kind of birth defects, it can cause person to have neutropenia. Infection. <clears throat> you know, sometimes when person has this bacterial infection, when they have bacterial infection, initially, what can happen? The WBC level goes like seriously high. Sometimes like 39, 40, seriously high. And if it goes so high, Okay, and they still have this constant bacterial infection. What can happen? Their body just gets tired of fighting. And eventually, the WBC starts coming down. That doesn't mean that their infection is gone and it's resolved. No, the WBC was just gotten tired fighting it. They still have this severe infection going on. Those bacteria eat up their WBC. And that's why they have this low level of WBC because infection is so high. So that is one of the cause for neutropenia. If person is taking certain drugs that can decrease their WBC count. So those are the main cause for neutropenia. When somebody has neutropenia, that means low level of WBC, that person is already high risk for bacterial infection. Frequent, you know, viral infection and also bacterial infection as well. Then we have leukemia. Leukemia, that is bunch of WBC. Neutropenia, that was like low level of WBC. Leukemia, that is higher level of WBC. That is basically cancer of WBC. That has this abnormal proliferation of the WBC, leukocytes. When somebody has this cancer of WBC going on, what kind of sign and symptoms do they have? They have this constitutional sign and symptoms. They feel fatigued, weak, tired, no appetite or anorexia. And because of that, they're gonna have weight loss and fever. So that is leukemia. Most of the time, leukemia is seen in the pediatric patient. They also have bone pain. They also have hepatosplenomegaly. Their liver and spleen is getting enlarged. That is leukemia. 
Then we have this polycythema vera. So what is this? Polycythema vera. What is going on here? Polycythema vera is a blur disorder. Okay. In this condition, person would have like too many RBCs. Too many RBCs. What can happen when somebody has like too many RBCs? That person is high risk for blood clot as well. Too many RBCs. They also have this increased production of EPO, erythropoietin, that is EPO. EPO is produced by kidney. So kidney is basically producing too much EPO, okay? And they have this too many RBCs floating around because it's stimulating bone marrow. Bone marrow is producing RBCs constantly. And in person is ended up having polycythema vera. So this is actually malignant disorder of bone marrow. Main sign and symptoms person would have, they have this headache, they have gout, they have bleeding, hypertension. The skin is very itchy, pruritus. Then we have this Hodgkin's lymphoma. When person presents to you and they have this swelling going on, it's rubbery, okay? Rubbery lump comes out and it doesn't hurt. They feel like this is ball-like structure pops out and it doesn't hurt. It's swollen, it's painless, it's rubbery. When you feel this, you can able to say that this is, you know, lymph nodes, okay? And this is lymph node is swelling up. Most of the time when person has lymph node swelling, it always hurts. But this is the only one condition where lymph gland swelling, it doesn't hurt. And that's where it is more worrisome. That's where we worry about most because it doesn't hurt. That is most likely Hodgkin's lymphoma. That is B cell malignancy. So what is B cell? We just talked about that under WBC. WBC that has lymphocytes. Lymphocytes has B cell and T cell and natural killer cell. So number one cell that is B cell and that's where this cancer is located. That is B cell malignancy. This person, they have hepatosplenomegaly. Their liver and spleen is enlarged. That's why they have belly pain, okay? The main thing with this Hodgkin's lymphoma, they have occurrence of lymphoma and then it subsides. They have this remission, okay? They, they have flare-up, they have remission. They have flare-up, remission. But they have poor prognosis, very poor prognosis. Normally, you know, um, the age for this diagnosis is 60, 60 to 65 for Hodgkin's lymphoma. Very poor prognosis. Once they have this diagnosis made, person will survive maybe like four to five years. That's it. That is poor prognosis in Hodgkin's lymphoma. Similar story with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma as well. But in detail, they have this cancer of natural killer cell, not B cell, okay? This is natural killer cell. But person would have similar sign and symptoms. They would have this swollen, painless, rubbery lymph gland and all this, fluoritis, fever, same sign and symptoms. Same prognosis, but inside cell proliferation is different. This is natural killer cell. That is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What do you do? You refer patient to oncologist, hematology and oncology. Then we have multiple myeloma. So what is multiple myeloma? This is a cancer of plasma cell.
average age is 60 to 70. So in multiple myeloma, what kind of sign and symptoms person would have? They would have fever, weakness, body ache, bone pain, just a general sign and symptoms. They have this vague weakness and fatigue and bone pain. Those are the main sign and symptoms. They have hyperviscosity syndrome. When somebody has hyperviscosity, what are the high risk? Blur clot, okay, blur clot. So for multiple myeloma, they, they also have like one thing that's called Benz Jones protein. Those plasma cells loves to hold on to the protein. But when they have cancer, when they bust open, okay, that protein goes through the kidney. That's why person is high risk for renal failure. Okay. This protein is goes through the kidney and they have this Benz Jones protein leaking in the urine. That is multiple myeloma. They also have lytic lesions. What is lytic lesion? As you can see in this CT scan picture. Lytic lesions are spots of the bone damage that results from the cancerous plasma cells building up in the bone marrow, okay? So as you can see in this picture, spots of the bone damage, the skull bone is damaged. Those are the circle right here. That is called lytic lesions. So that is multiple myeloma. There is cancer of the plasma cell. Person will have Benz Jones protein leaking in the urine. That is the main thing. Then we have thrombocytopenia. What is thrombocytopenia? Platelets. So here we are talking about platelets. Their platelets are low. When somebody has low platelet, what can happen? First of all, let's understand how does platelet help? If somebody's bleeding inside platelet, it's gonna form a clot and stop bleeding. But when somebody has low platelet, what can happen? That person's gonna continuously bleed. They have, they are high risk for easy bruising and bleeding because their platelet, it's gonna all come together, but it's not gonna be enough. They're not gonna bind all together and make a wall, tight wall because they don't have this capacity. Those platelets are not enough, okay? So that is thrombocytopenia. They have easy bruising, bleeding, sometimes spontaneous nosebleed, hematuria, GI bleed, stuff like that. So what do we do in this condition? We avoid certain medication that's gonna make person to bleed, such as we avoid Helicus, Zeralto, Aspirin, Plavix, all those medications, Coumadin, Pradexa. We also check person CBC, PT, PTT, everything. We rule out other disorders that can cause person to have low platelets. We also rule out idiopathic thrombocytopenia. So those are the conditions. Then we have this idiopathic thrombocytopenia. What is that? Thrombocytopenia purpura. What kind of sign and symptoms this person has? They have this potential rash. Idiopathic, what is idiopathic means? Unknown reason, we don't know why it's there. What is causing this, don't know. Idiopathic, unclear etiology. Low platelets, unclear etiology. Idiopathic thrombocytopenia. So 
So they have this low platelet. When somebody has low platelet, what can happen? Potential rash, epistaxis, bleeding, menorrhagia, GI bleed, intracranial hemorrhage, anything can happen. Treatment, supportive treatment. Sometimes corticosteroid, steroid therapy, it's gonna help. Splenectomy, it's gonna help as well. Then we have this one Willy Brand disease. So what is this one Willy Brand disease? What is going on here? This is also platelet problem, okay? In this condition, Platelet production is good, okay? All those platelet is gonna produce and all this, that's fine. But they do not have this capacity where it's gonna all bind together and make a blood clot. They don't have capacity. They're not gonna stick together. Normally, you know, all those platelet, it's gonna stick together, right? In this one Willy Brandt disease, those platelets are not sticking together. They just don't have this capacity. So what's the point of having normal level of platelet? Person, if they are bleeding, they're going to bleed. There's nothing to stop them. They're going to have bleeding, GI bleed, menorrhagia, easy bruising, everything. So what is the treatment? Desmopressin. Desmopressin is the choice of treatment for one very brand disease. All right, so that's about it. All right, very good. So this one was actually short system. That's why we got it done early. Rada, the class that we um, did, didn't do, is that going to be tomorrow? The cardiac system? Yeah. Yes. Cardiac system is going to be tomorrow, yeah. Is there any way we can reschedule the date? Why? I had something going on. I didn't even realize. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. But everybody agreed to do it, you know, and so that's how we are doing it. And Bella, you did join cardiac system a couple of times before, didn't you? Didn't you join in June as well? I just don't remember it. That's why. Oh, goodness. <laughs> that's okay. So, you know, um, you can definitely get the recordings. And, and you already have it. You already have recordings. Okay. And the recording is not the same when you have it live. Yes, yes, and then yes, I agree with that. You you have joined live in June, and this is the second time you are joining live. Uh, we you know we have set this up. Um, there are many students agreed, so I'm gonna go for it. Okay. Rada, I have the recording that you sent me. This is Sandra, and I actually do think it it's a really good review, also. Yes, well, thank you. Um, and is it still like up to date from when I purchased it last year, according to the? Uh, yes. Okay. The uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So, so just uh, a few information here and there, new points. You know, if I learn something, I'm gonna add this for for you to understand and all this. You know. So. Okay. As I learn, I'm gonna up to date all those PowerPoints as well. So you're gonna see new information coming out. But those recordings that I made last year, I try my best and use all this information I have to make those slides. You know, so those are also as equivalent to this as well. Matter of fact, I have added extra information in that review as well because it was brand new and I was doing it. I wanted to do it all. Okay, I was just nervous because some students are posting about the new fourth edition of leak and the test. 
So I didn't know if they were different or the same. No, no, no. Let me tell you, if you are smart enough, okay, if you are smart enough, like one point, one point or few points, it's not going to be matter to you, okay, because you're going to figure out answer yourself. Okay. Because you have so much information. Okay, don't worry about just a few, few, you know, here and there point. Just okay. focus big, big focus. Okay. Yeah. Next year, you know, leak is going to come out with like fifth edition. Are you going to worry about that by the time you are done passing? You know, I mean, she's going to keep changing all this, uh, maybe few points. That's what she did from third to fourth. She had so many mistakes in third edition that she has corrected in fourth one and just added few new points. That's it. What is our job? Our job is because our brain is just blank right now, right? We are learning, we are preparing. So whatever information we get, we just have to grasp everything, you know, and try our best in the exams. That's it. Few, you know, here and there, new points and guidelines changing and all this. Don't even worry about that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 